Today we're going to be looking at a channel called Modern Muscle. Specifically this video called How Would the United States Fight World War III? Those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check it out. The United States operates under a nuclear triad, consisting of land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, sea-based submarines armed with submarine-launched ballistic missiles, or SLBMs, and air-based strategic bombers, carrying gravity bombs and air-launched nuclear cruise missiles. Now let's take a look at each part of America's triad and its weapon delivery systems. The What's crazy is how much of this is within the public domain, <laughs> at least as far as the ICBMs and the bombers are concerned. The subs is a bit more classified, and the location of the subs, we're not supposed to know. Then again, this is just what we're being told, and the real numbers might be a little different. First and most well-known part of America's nuclear triad is its land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs. The U.S. has 400 LGM-30 Miniman-3 ICBMs that are launched via silos. <laughs> These 400 missiles have a range of over 6,000 miles and have near pinpoint accuracy. When launched, the Three Strays Miniman 3 travels at speeds of over 15,000 miles per hour, reaching its target in under 30 minutes. Each Miniman 3 missile carries one warhead. 200 Miniman 3 missiles are armed with a 335 kiloton W87 Mark 21A warhead. While Those are actually, well, they're, they're still big, they're devastating, they're not as big as some of the nuclear weapons were in the 1960s on the order of multiple megatons per warhead but they're a lot more accurate like you said the other half are armed with a 300 kiloton w78 mark 12 warhead each warhead has around 40 times the destructive power of the bombs dropped on japan in 1945 America's Miniman 3 silos are based in three rural areas. The 90th Missile Wing at F.E. Warren Air Base in Colorado, Nebraska, and Wyoming. The 91st Missile Wing at Minot Air Force Base in North missile Dakota. And the funny. 341st <laughs> Missile Wing at Maelstrom Air Force Base in Montana. Each Maelstrom Air Force Base, that's uh, very appropriately named. It has three squadrons, and each squadron has 50 Miniman 3 silos. They're collectively controlled by five hardened underground control launch centers, each operated with two military officers around the clock at all times. In the event that launch command centers are destroyed in a surprise attack, or the military officers inhabiting the launch command control centers get cold feet, these missiles can and will be remotely launched from an airborne command center, carrying... It's interesting that you can launch them remotely, and also, how would you like that job? Be the, the guys on back shift just watching the missiles, those two guys? No. And not just because it's working back shift, I've done enough of that in my career. Orders from the president. As with all things, there are advantages and disadvantages of the silo-based Miniman 3. Its primary advantage is that these 400 missiles make the most responsive leg of the nuclear triad. America's land-based yeah. ICBM force has remained on continuous, around-the-clock, 24-7 alert since 1959. They can be quickly launched in less than five minutes. America's silo-based ICBMs offer a strategic advantage as well. Due to their remote launch capability, an effective nuclear attack against America's Minutemen 3 silos will require at least 400 warheads, or one bomb aimed at each silo, forcing the enemy to use and deplete a considerable amount of their nuclear arsenal. But the I guess, yeah, if they're all in, they're all in hardened uh, silos that, and they're spread out enough that you couldn't, you couldn't take out a bunch of them with one hit. Strategic advantage also highlights the Miniman 3's disadvantages. America's land-based Miniman 3s are inherently vulnerable, as their location is commonly known, and therefore silos can and will be easily targeted. As a result, in the event of a large-scale attack, the president would be put in a sticky situation. He or she would have to either use these 400 missiles or lose them, forcing a large-scale retaliatory attack in response to perceived incoming warheads targeting American silos. If you want to see me react to another video where you kind of go through that scenario as in you're given the hey our missile silos are about to get taken out what would you do um i'll pin a comment down below kurtz Gazat did an, an interesting video on that enemy missiles already in flight the leader of the free world would only have 15 minutes to decide and once a missile is launched there's no turning back 
One thing I would add, um, if you're going to destroy missile silos, is you're going to want to go with a ground-based nuclear strike because a lot of them are buried in hardened structures. Most of them are airburst for like attacking bases, cities, just causing as much widespread destruction as possible. But in this case, you're going to want to concentrate that destructive firepower to the silo itself in order to reliably destroy it. Not to say an airburst couldn't destroy a silo, but it's a little, um, it's a bit more iffy. So that is one thing that he mentioned earlier about expending your nuclear weapons to take out the, uh, the U.S.'s nuclear weapons. You'd have to, you'd be limiting the amount of widespread destruction you would cause otherwise. The second arm of America's nuclear triad is its air based strategic bombers. The U.S. Air Force currently operates a fleet of 66 strategic bombers. America's strategic bombers are organized into nine bomb squadrons and five bomb wings at three bases Minute Air Force Base in North Dakota, Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, and Whitman Air Force Base in Missouri. There are 300 nuclear weapons currently deployed at strategic bomber bases in the U.S. An additional 100 tactical nuclear bombs are deployed at NATO air bases in Europe. Hmm. America's bomber fleet consists of Tactical nukes are way, way smaller on the order of a couple of kilotons at most. 6 B-52 Stratofortress bombers and 20 B-2 stealth bombers. B-2 stealth bomber can carry up to 16 1200 kiloton nuclear gravity bombs. That's a big one. Each gravity bomb contains a massive payload of 150 times the destructive power of the bomb dropped in Hiroshima. The B-52 Stratofortress bomber is a long-range heavy bomber with the ability to travel up to 9,000 miles without refueling. The B-52 carries up to 20 AGM-86 subsonic air launch cruise missiles. When launched, the AGM-86 missile can travel over 1,500 miles. I usually didn't realize, so can crew, are the cruise missiles too bulky to be carried by the B-2 stealth bomber? I don't actually know. Yeah, I can understand, yeah, the B- the B-2s for sneak attacks and the B-52s just for larger carrying capacity and presumably weapons they could deploy from further away. One interesting thing that I didn't realize was that a lot of the ICBMs were single warhead. I know at one point MIRVs were a thing that's multiple independently targeted re-entry vehicles, basically a fancy word meaning we're going to put a bunch of warheads in one missile and they would split out over a certain target. But maybe I'm thinking of maybe I'm thinking of a different weapon than the Minuteman. He's exceeding 555 miles per hour using its independent guidance system to deliver a W80 150 kiloton warhead to its target in less than 90 seconds. Each warhead contains around 20 times the destructive power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The primary advantage of using air-based strategic bombers is that they can be called back if necessary. That's Further true. Furthermore, subsonic air launch nuclear. One misconception that is out there is you see in all these action movies like Mission Impossible that, oh, if I could just upload the abort codes to these ICBMs that are currently in flight to disable them. Not a thing. Or if it is a thing, it's kept outside of the public domain. But <laughs> yeah, no, uh, no magical abort codes. That I'm aware of. Cruise missiles are a lot harder to defend against. When launched, an enemy force would have to counterattack each missile individually, making defense costly and complicated. The small size also makes them difficult to detect on radar. And they're low too, yeah. The primary disadvantage of strategic bombers is their response time. They take a lot longer to get in the air. And if air bases aren't on high alert, or if planes aren't already in flight, there's a high probability of them being destroyed in an initial surprise attack. Also, I'm curious how many of them have that similar uh, staffing situation where you have um, people on station constantly. I'm as, I imagine they do. Um, again, not, not, a, not an Air Force or, or a military guy, but it's probably not all of the strategic bombers in existence all the time. It's particularly true for bomber bases located in Europe. Yeah, just because you're closer. Oh, is this a declassified target list? Wow, yep. Yep. Chilling.
Good choice in sound effects, too. The last and most important part of America's nuclear triad are its nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines. The U.S. Navy operates a fleet of 14 Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines. Each submarine carries 20 Trident II submarine-launched ballistic missiles. The Trident II SLBM is the most destructive weapon in America's nuclear arsenal. Each missile is armed with either four or okay, five Okay, this is the one with the Merv. All right. Kiloton WAA I stand corrected. In theory, each sub can launch his entire 20-missile payload, virtually undetected in under seven minutes. When launched, the three-stage Trident II travels at speeds of over 18,000 miles per hour, has a range of over 7,500 miles, and typically reaches its target or targets in around 15 minutes. Each warhead is guided by a multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicle, there you or go. MIRV, Use it. <laughs> allowing a single Trident II missile to deliver up to five warheads to five separate targets. Just one Trident II missile alone, armed with five warheads, has 154 times the destructive power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Overall, the U.S. has around 70% of all of its warheads on submarines. What's especially dangerous is it's spread out. And this is one of the reasons why the doctrine shift compared to like just in the, in the 60s having these big 10, 15 megaton, all the way up to 50 megatons in the case of the Soviet Union's crazy Tsar Obama. But it's just going to be concentrated to one area. This could be they could be spread out over the course of a few hundred miles during the uh, missiles re-entry phase and can more selectively target it target certain areas this is why so ultimately it's going to cause more damage to enemy assets compared to and for a lot less use of nuclear material than it would for those larger um single bombs so it's more efficient destruction and but overall all these numbers even if you add them all up in terms of firepower it's less than it used to be during the during the height of the cold war but there's still enough nuclear weapons to do unparalleled horrific damage but the scenario involving all the nukes plunging the earth into nuclear winter um i talk a bit more about that in the video that i pin that i'll pin in the comments but it's not there, and it's it's not even as as close to it as it was a few decades ago. With good reason. There are numerous advantages of the ballistic missile submarine. For starters, they make up the most survivable leg of the nuclear triad. Ballistic missile submarines are virtually undetectable at sea. Their stealth design makes finding one an almost impossible task. So I was in the Navy, but a lot of my teammates at the nuclear plant came out of the nuclear Navy, and a lot of them were on submarines. And they would tell me crazy stories about how close they would get to um russia or whoever and just how sneaky those those submarines are um how stealthy those submarines are that is probably the biggest advantage and one of the um, spookiest things about it also second strike capability they could um get exhaust in a massive nuclear exchange with icbms but even if the target country is completely destroyed sub-launch nukes could still um, take revenge on whoever attacked them. In case you needed another reason why not to fight a nuclear war and how the very idea of winning one is absurd. Of course, you could say that about any type of war, but nuclear war is especially. Being paused to potential adversaries. With at least 10 submarines on constant patrol at all times, ballistic missile submarines assure that the U.S. can strike at any time, anywhere, even after a surprise attack. With each yeah. sub carrying an average of 100 warheads each, they have enough firepower to make just one submarine the sixth most powerful nuclear power in the world. In terms of disadvantages, they're simply... I guess that's true, yeah, because there is... It's, the U.S. and Russia have massive amounts of nuclear weapons, but all the other countries aren't on the same level, both in terms of number of warheads or in terms of megatons of destructive power. But yes, how one of these vessels by itself be that devastating. And how, I forget where the quote was from, but it was like the captain of a nuclear submarine 
is more powerful than well over 90% of the uh, heads of state in the world just based on what he's, the amount of destructive firepower he's capable of causing. Or none. Major attack option one. When people imagine a nuclear war, the first thing that comes to mind is large cities like Los Angeles and Moscow being incinerated in a blaze of nuclear hellfire. While this would definitely be a likely outcome, the reality is that around 70% of- Says LA, 3.8 million dead. Um, gonna take more than one missile to do that just because of a city being sprawling, but still very, very possible given a full-scale nuclear war. 1,800 nuclear warheads currently deployed by the United States aren't aimed at large cities, but instead at an enemy country's nuclear forces. To better understand this, we first need to take a look at America's current strategic nuclear war plan, also known as the Single current Integrated Plan. Or oh, it even shows, uh, it has a little chart saying what the, uh, what the dose is from these attacks. Give you a sense of scale, uh, 1,000 rem is 10 sieverts, so... Death all but guaranteed. 50% of the population dead within 60 days at around 400 to 600 rem, and that's with treatment, which is going to be challenging in the event of a nuclear war. And this scale goes up to over 10,000. You can get very high doses from nuclear weapons. The one thing I will say is the dose gets much higher on ground-based attacks versus airburst attacks, because the airburst, the... Uh, the fallout's not going to linger in one area as long just because it's going to be blown out. But ground attacks, like the ones that are going to destroy silos, get a lot of dose. Yeah. First drawn up in 1950, the PSYOP focused primarily on the Soviet Union. While today most of the weapons in the war plan still target Russia, other countries such as China, North Korea, India, and Pakistan are included as well. Didn't know about in this India video, and we'll take a look at a nuclear exchange with the only hmm. nuclear power comparable to the United States, the Russian Federation. I mean, I know they had nuclear weapons, but I didn't know that they were included on a potential target list. This portion of America's nuclear war plan is called Major Attack Option 1. Major Attack Option 1 is the most demanding attack option available to the president. Should the commander-in-chief order major attack option one, the resulting attack would consist of over 1,000 warheads targeting Russian nuclear forces, including ICBM silos, road mobile ICBMs, submarine oh, bases, that, yeah. primary airfields, nuclear storage facilities, design and production complexes, critical command and control facilities, and civilian population centers. I was going to say, a lot of, I'd imagine a lot of design areas would be in cities. Now let's take a look at a major attack option one, its Russian targets, the American nuclear weapons used, and the overall outcome of an American thermonuclear attack on Russia. Yeah. <laughs> to be continued. Don't know if there's a part two or if it's intentionally left ambiguous. That was a very well done diagram. I especially like the choice of the harrowing launch alarm sounds and the sound effects of the explosions complete with the declassified target lists. One thing that kind of surprised me was how low yield a lot of the weapons were for the ICBMs. I, uh, I thought some of the ICBMs were larger, but clearly the knowledge and stuff that I learned about studying in, in school was out of date. That's a good thing. <laughs> the fact that the amount of uh, nuclear weapons has gone down as recently as 10, 15 years ago is definitely a good thing. That was probably one of the more well done nuclear war things I've seen. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.